We can start. Okay, good afternoon. We are here to continue to celebrate Child Protection Week, but today it's International Children's Day. I just want to welcome our Honorable Minister, Minister Zulu, our Deputy Minister, uh, Deputy Minister Bokhopane Zulu, and all the girls and boys that are connected. Here we've got a Gauteng ambassador, but we also have all other ambassadors connected uh, virtually. You know, if the one thing that COVID has taught us is that we can do things differently. And this is the first time we do this, and we're loving it. How are you, boys and girls? We're good. Yes. We're good. Yes. Good. Thank good. you. Thank you. <laughs> So before we start, I would just want you to introduce yourselves because we've got a program that we have drafted that will follow, which we have already briefed you on. So can I have Eastern Cape introducing yourself to the minister and the deputy minister and all South Africans? Good afternoon, minister and our office uh, and my fellow ambassadors, all citizens, especially the children. My name is Mam Jack, and I'm the Eastern Cape Child Ambassador. Thank you. Can we come to Free State? Free State. Hack Free Start. Introduce yourself. Good afternoon, fellow parliamentarians. Good afternoon, fellow parliamentarians, caregivers, and to you all tuned in at home. My name is Sulfala Suma and I am the National Sergeant of Arms. Thank you. Gauteng. Gauteng is in the room. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tatum Shung, the Speaker of Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament and the Child Ambassador of Gauteng. Thank you. Liam Pompo. Um, greetings to all the children out there and the minister. I go by the name of Masari Tsetsepanga, not Ambassador of Africa. Um, greetings to everyone out there and respectively the children of South Africa. I am Ramya Freddy and I'm the president of the Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament. Thank you. KZN. So the minister, the deputy minister and all of my South Africans, I greet you this wonderful Children's Day. This is Sivirin Boyana from KZN. Thank you, KZN Pumalanga. Greetings to all South Africans. I'd love to greet all the children in our country. I am Butema Tebula, the child ambassador of Mpumalanga. Thank you, Bule. Northern Cape, North Cap. <laughs> Um, good day, everyone. Everyone viewing this and to all children of South Africa and all the provinces, good day to you all. My name is Cesar Limburg and I am the Child Ambassador of the Northern Cape. Thank you. Northwest. Good afternoon, Minister Zulu. I'm the Minister Mkhopane and all protocol observed. My name is Uteke Mbabeile and I am the current Northwest Children's Parliament Ambassador. Good, good day, Honorable Minister and fellow Child Ambassadors. I am Yusuf Bayat, Deputy President of the Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament. Thank you, Northwest. Western Cape, you also too introduce yourselves. We didn't hear that. We didn't hear it. Alessio, can you repeat yourself? 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Then the other participant from Western Cape. Good day, Honorable Minister and Deputy Minister. I am Ayaka Dono from the Western Province, and I greet all the young South Africans out there. Thank you so much, boys and girls. Now we are continuing with our program. I will call upon our Honorable Deputy Minister to do opening remarks and greet you, and then followed by the keynote address by the Minister. Thank you. Good afternoon, Minister. Uh, good afternoon, girls and boys. Good afternoon, guys. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. afternoon. Let's let's say afternoon to South Africa's children and say we wish them happy International Children's Day. And for those kids that are doing history, you will know that this day has been celebrated since 1960. So it's been a day that's been there to actually recognize the rights of South Africa's children. You'll also know that the day came about because women met and women felt that it's important that we begin to actually give children a platform to be heard, not only to be heard, but also to be seen to be understood and also given a place. So today we celebrate International Children's Day as South Africa under obviously uh, very difficult situations. And we take this opportunity to reflect on what actually uh, this day means as the world over faces the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And what does it actually mean for us as children? Um, to children, as we give you feedback, we want to say the plan of action for children will be going to cabinet uh, soon. Um, it's being consulted upon and you will know as child ambassadors, but also as South Africa's children that you have indeed participated in the consultations and you have actually handed over when we started the sixth administration, uh, the children's uh, manifesto that actually was a contribution to the plan of action for children. But we also know that every child... Um, we are covered in terms of South Africa's constitution and our rights as children are absolute. And those are the only rights in the South African constitution that are not progressive. So what does that actually mean for us as children? Um, today, as we uh, look at COVID-19, what does COVID-19 say to children? It says a number of things, which together as a government, as children, as families, as grandparents, but also actually as the village that we are trying to reconstruct. Mm. We keep on talking about the village, but now we need to find our way back to the village because we've lost the village. And we know the saying that said, it takes a village to raise a child. Somehow, as we became smaller nuclear families, uh, we lost the issue around the village. So as the Department of Social Development, we need to build the village back. So what do we need to get our village back? We need children that are actually raised in a family that is conducive. The family that does not constitute of the mother, the father, two kids, a cat and a dog. No. We need the family that actually takes into consideration the role of auntie, ugoko, umkulu, umalume, uh, so that we don't begin to talk about extended families, but we talk about a family unit that has a support system. Because when we lost the village, we also lost not only the village, we lost a support system for young women like myself of childbearing age. We never used to struggle in terms of whether we go into the farm, whether we're going out, whether we go into the river, there will always be somebody to look after our children. What did COVID do? COVID and lockdown brought a number of challenges for children. 
but I know, Minister, the children will tell us. But let me share what I have picked up and the support that we had to give to children. Children had to look after themselves. Because as South Africa, we are a country that abuses alcohol. And with a lot of abuse of alcohol comes the removal of alcohol, unsupervised detoxification. A lot of families went into detox. Parents were present physically, but they were shaking, sitting on the couch, crying, all of what represents detox, and they could not look after their children. Children had to look after themselves. And that is another lesson that we have learned. But a lot of children shared very difficult stories. So I think as we look at our parenting program, we need to say, what are we going to do differently, Connie, in terms of positive parenting? Because the parenting program resides with us as social development. What did COVID also say? COVID said children were exposed to a lot of gender-based violence where mothers and fathers just could not coexist. A time that was supposed to be a family time, even though it was the virus that was forcing us to be together, but a lot of children were exposed to violence in their places where they were supposed to feel the most safe, the home. So we had to now intervene and interfere in that which was supposed to be the best of family time because parents were fighting and they could not coexist. But with the exposure of visual and the whole exposure of a lot of children having to be in the internet, we experienced an increase in cyberbullying. But it also said to us, there is a lot of policy and there's a lot of education that needs to happen in terms of parents understanding what kind of content their children are exposed to from the phones we buy them and the time that they spend because that's what lockdown showed us the time that our children spend in front of the television watching shows and content that are not child friendly and that as parents we subscribe to a lot of the a, a, you know, nice DSTV channels, but actually we don't understand the issue of parental control and the importance of why parental control needs to be in place. So we saw a lot of children being exposed to a lot of content that are not really child friendly. And that contributed to additional frustrations that children experienced by being locked down. We also saw a lot of children out in the streets because their homes are very small. And when the adults are in the house, the children had to go outside. And children had to play outside, sometimes without warm clothes in the cold, without masks on their faces, even though we said uh, it's important that we have a mask. We also saw a lot of disabled children that were left without caregivers. And the caregivers could not get to the homes our autistic children had to forfeit that which is an issue of life and death, the walk that actually makes them to be able to function. And the blind kids, when we talk about social distancing, a lot of cases, a minister, that we had to intervene, where police could not just understand that when that mother walks with that blind child, or when I walk with my husband as I stand here, there can't be social distancing, because if I don't know the place where I am, I have to hold on to somebody. And those are some of the realities. The caregivers that has to protect those disabled children that require 24-hour care and the actually a, a PPE that is needed by the caregivers because after washing every child, changing every child's nappy, they have to change the gloves. And those were some of the challenges that we had to experience as the Department of Social Development in ensuring that those programs continue to run within the health protocols and within the regulations that were um, uh, put in place. But I think as children, I loved the fact that we introduced ourselves as the Nelson Mandela Children's uh, Ambassadors. Because for a lot of children in the world, they don't have the opportunities to be heard. We know that the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Article 12, requires every member state 
government as a whole to ensure that they engage children in whatever decision that affects the child. We can give ourselves a pat on the shoulder, Minister, but we can also acknowledge there's a lot that we need to do. South Africa engages its children. South Africa's children are heard. South Africa's children are seen. South Africa's children have rights. South Africa's children are understood. And we hear your voices as you call on to us. Your government, your grandparents, your uncles, your mothers, your fathers, your aunties, but also amongst yourselves, because children can also be very cruel to each other. So it is very important that together as South Africans, as we celebrate International Children's Day, we stand up and we say and we hear and affirm the voice of children when they say, secure my future, protect me today. Not next week, not next month, today. And we committed as this government, as the Department of Social Development, the custodians of the rights of children, to say, we are hearing you, we are securing your future, and we aspire to protect you today in partnership with yourselves. I thank you. Thank you, um, Deputy Minister, for those opening remarks. Really food for thought for all South Africans and everyone else who's listening, and also the children themselves. I will change the program a bit. I just want now to listen to our girls and boys, and then Minister will come later and respond to issues that you shall have raised. Because if she speaks now, she'll have to come back and respond to you again, because you can't speak to yourself. So now, I will request Eastern Cape. Are you ready, my Jack? Yes, ma'am, I'm ready. Yes, speak to us. Uh, good afternoon again to the minister, her office, my fellow ambassadors, all citizens, all citizen, citizens who are watching. Uh, my name is Mamgele Jack, the Eastern Cape Child Ambassador. We are all facing the biggest crisis of our time, and every experience is different. But one thing is clear. Our lives will never be the same again. Children are the most adversely affected by this, and the children of the Eastern Cape face a number of challenges during this time. Many kids have no phones, laptops, or, or any sort of internet access, so online studying is impossible for them. They have to rely on textbooks and written material, which is also lacking. Children in the Eastern Cape, which is vast with five rural distri districts with no proper, proper infrastructure, face sanitation facilities deficit. Many schools, especially in the rural areas, rely on pit toilets and water taps, but they don't have uh, modern water delivery systems. This is, a, this, is a health, uh, sorry. this is a health hazard during this period of coronavirus, whereby all the citizens are expected to regularly wash their hands, not to mention the lack of PPEs, which are necessary for derailing the spread of the virus. Basically, our entire way of life has been uprooted for those of us in the final year of high school. Already, we had an enormous amount of, of academic workload and find it hard to cope during this, this stressful time. But the lockdown itself has had some benefits because we have now adopted the practice of self-studying. And we are now learning not to rely on our teachers, but rather to learn to in interpret our study material in our own way and we're learning to be independent. This period has also given us time to better ourselves, learning new skills, adapting new wonderful habits, and even bonding with our fam families. Having said that, there are children who are locked up in abusive houses with abusive parents who are, who are abusing their children due to retrenchments at work or just general abusive nature. As the children of the Eastern Cape, we, we request the speeding up of provisions uh, of water taps and all sanitation facilities in the districts. I thank you. Thank you, Jack, for your input. Um, remember, my boys and girls, if you are two, you're going to share the five minutes. So it's two and a half and two and a half to the other one. So now can I call Free State Tsulu Fellow? <clears throat> I say again, good afternoon, fellow parliamentarians. 
ministers, caregivers, and to you all tuned in at home, though, I'm gratefully thankful for the platform given. This week on the 4th of June will mark 11 weeks since the start of the nationwide lockdown, which has brought the benefit of restricting the spread of COVID-19. But this solution has brought its own problems, not only to our serving adults, but to us minors included. During this isolation, children are facing even more issues than before. Since the start of lockdown, not only has the number of confirmed coronavirus cases risen, but so has the tally for child abuse and gender-based violence. For a high number of children, home isn't actually sweet and safe, but rather risky and violent. Others feel arrested in their own homes. So in my experiences, I've advised my fellow peers to contact social workers who can provide help with their psychological issues. Essential needs such as food and water has also become a nationwide um, issue. It is noted that billions of liters of water has been supplied, but there's still a lot more needed and to be distributed. I urge the government, foundations, funds, and organizations to continue with their productive work in donating water. Bear in mind, though, that there's districts and municipalities that are struggling with electricity, such as the Kumagul municipality in Bares, Free State. How can we study online without having electricity to power our own devices? Another issue is our, uh, is our education. Most classes can't even continue physically without being physically in class. The efforts of engaging online classes has been recognized and appreciated, alongside with networks and links used to provide free online classes. But the issue remains that others don't have devices which they can utilize to attend these online classes. In the attempt to gather all the knowledge needed for our final exams, I encourage all learning, all learning facilities to extend schooling hours, and if necessary, weekend classes will be enrolled. Anxiety kicks in for some kids when they're at home for too long. For them, being at home for a longer period, not only being at school basically for a longer period, not only lowers their levels of anxiety, but also will keep all kids from exposure towards drugs, and substance abuse. While at school, the practice of social distancing won't be easy, but that holds no excuse for schools not to be hygienic. Therefore, I encourage all schools to give out their own maximum effort to supply their own hand sanitizers, toilet papers, and masks for the staff and the learners. Cleaning essentials should be utilized uh, to keep their school's uh, premises clean as well. I urge various companies to make masks for schools which are less fortunate to supply their own. We don't all share a complete and healthy respiratory system. There are kids out there living with asthma who find breathing with other masks a difficulty. I suggest that mask manufacturers use a material or fabric which can be used for everyone. In my conclusion, if our children are not to be cared for, then what is to be of our great nation? For your time and attention, I thank you. Thank you so much for your input, Sulu. Um, now I'll call upon our Gauteng ambassador who is in studio with us, uh, Tato. Come and address us. A child is a beam of sunlight from the infinite and eternal with possibilities of virtue and vice. A child is not a thing to be molded, but then a person to be unfolded. There's literally nothing in this world that can ever replace a child. A child is irreplaceable. Ladies and gentlemen, I agree to all. My name is Tatum Tlung, the Speaker of Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament and the Child Ambassador of Gauteng. Thank you, Minister, for allowing us children to share with you our experiences. We need more of platforms like this. As we continue fighting the pandemic, we should never forget to embrace children's voices in all decisions affecting them. This goes to education, health, protection, and governance. In a nutshell, what I'm trying to say is that as much as we're fighting the pandemic, children should be the face of this pandemic rather than being among its biggest victims. Gauteng province is one of the most unique provinces with too many informal settlements. 
uh, and it cases for different countries. Uh, with the country fighting the pandemic, there have been too many lessons learned in terms of backlog of service delivery across the country and consultation. I have break down my experiences in categories. Category number one being education. Well, it has been difficult for me and most of the children in the provinces to learn as I do not have a TV at home and my cell phone is one of those which struggles to open documents, as you can see. With the school set to open... In a few weeks' time, I cannot lie, I am scared, but somehow relieved that in a few weeks' time, I will be able to have uh, contact with teachers as working with teachers via WhatsApp has been difficult. I recommend that we try and explore whilst adhering to the regulations in schools, and it is going to be difficult, I cannot lie, but then cancelling the academic year will delay us. I know some of us who are 18, some of us who are 17 and doing metric, it's much easier for us, but then have you ever thought of that child who's 19 years old, who's 20 years old and doing grade 12 and is expected to finish grade 12 within the age of 21? May children be consulted in redesigning of the education method as they are the ones supposed to go into those institutions. Category number two being protection. I am from Katlehong where a man was shot with a rubber bullet in front of children and to date we have three children who got hit by metro cars and recently where I come from we had a case whereby a man shot his wife in front of a five-year-old and not only that but then he also killed himself. How traumatic the accident experience has been for that child. These incidences will contribute to anxiety and depression of children, although we are largely spared from the direct effects of COVID-19, but then we need to acknowledge the fact that the crisis of COVID-19 will have a, a profound effect on children's well-being. May we please prioritize psychosocial support for all children in a child-friendly manner. Yes, currently we have um, child line, but then it operates on certain hours and some of us have breakdowns in the middle of the night. Thank you, SAPS, for sharing stats of number of reported cases on gender-based violence. May we please have number? Uh, may we please have data showing number of reported cases on child abuse? Um, we believe that as children, we can assist in monitoring and we can develop more messages combating such behaviour. Last but not least, under social. Unfortunately, I am one of those kids whose parents lost income during COVID-19. Uh, you can imagine how the stress it is at home as no one is, as no one is employed. Uh, the stress at home is on the peak. I am raised by my mother. And my father is one of those people who are taken from the streets simply because he is a user. You don't know how difficult it has been for me as a child not knowing how to assist. I am a child, I deserve to be loved. I do reach out to save the children's group. Thanks to the children's group that we have, it, has, it helps most of the time. But I am ready for full psychological support as I do not want to grow up with pain. Minister, may we please be consulted and also be allowed to, uh, to, to contribute to the solutions. Let's protect the generation of children to fully develop. Please open up platforms for us like this, not just today or during COVID-19, but forever. Children's voices matter too, I think. Thank you so much. Gauteng Ambassador Tato, what a story. Can we continue? We have lots of stories around the country, but you can see what our children are going through. Can we call Limpompo? You are two, my boys and girls. Just make sure you share the minutes, two and a half, two and a half. That is Freddy and Tsepang. Okay, thank you very much. And as I have already introduced myself, I go by the name of Masha Tsepan. And as my fellow ambassadors have mentioned um, a lot of issues, I think that 
we relate to um, some of the issues that they have mentioned. We still have the issues like um, data battles because right now, ladies and gentlemen, we are expected to um, access the learning website, but we do not have data for that. We still have families that lost their source of income, but their children are still expected to access the learning website, which um, a lot of them are not um, related. So that have, have been a, a challenge to us. And the other issue was um, child participation. We feel like um, a lot of decisions were to and where to be without children's voices. Um, we feel that um, child participation was not practiced because the last time we checked, child participation was just the active involvement of children in the decision making of things that affect them. So if we have something big like this that affects us, and then we have decisions that are true, they feel like we should also be, be consulted um, because there's nothing for us, there's, there's nothing that should be for us without us. And I'll pass it to my president. Well, dear fellow South Africans, my name is Romeo Kredi, as I've introduced myself, and I'm the president of the Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament. This is a difficult time that we are facing as the children of South Africa, and indeed, as the constitution states that the children's interest are of the, the, the paramount interest. It means we are supposed to be prioritized during this period of um, the pandemic. Um, we realize that many decisions are, are being made without the consultation of um, children. We need children to give in inputs into things that affect their day-to-day -day lives. But with that said, I would love to acknowledge the benefits that the lockdown have applied into the life of many children out there. We can realize that the state of drug and substance abuse is now low. And again, we can also recognize that um, our young ones are now practicing um, fitness lifestyle. They're they practicing healthy lifestyle. And again, we've learned to advance ourselves into um, adapting to the fourth industrial revolution because now we are starting from our own Cell phone, cell phone, although other learners out there, they are unable to do that. But the question that is left here is, our learners were forced to adapt um, to the fourth industrial revolution method. They were learning from WhatsApp platforms, studying PDF study guides. So the question now is, if we are to reopen schools, are we going to allow our children to take their cell phones back to school as they've already adapted to that kind of learning? South Africa, our children might be the smallest population of tomorrow, but definitely they are the 100% of tomorrow's. They, they, they might be um, the smallest population of today, but they are definitely the 100% 100 of tomorrow's population. I thank you. Thank you, Lipompo, and the president there. Can we now go to the viewer in uh, KZN? Once again, I greet my beautiful nation on this beautiful day. This is Siviwe Moyana, the Child Ambassador for KZN. Um, so during this national lockdown, we've been told to stay within the confines of our homes uh, to protect ourselves from COVID-19. However, more issues have risen because of that situation. Uh, the first issue will be online learning for all of us, I think. As we all know, it, that has been a problem for many people. We have households that don't have electricity, smartphones, or any other technological devices. Some schools um, in rural areas or even urban areas don't uh, provide textbooks. So the child is stuck at home with no means of moving forward. The second issue is vandalism in schools. KZN has had 225 incidents of theft, burglary, and arson in schools since the start of the lockdown, and only nine people have been arrested for it. The third issue would, would be poverty. Since the lockdown started, uh, parents or breadwinners have lost their jobs, which means that they've lost income to buy food and basic necessities. People are starving, and as much as food parcels are going around, not everyone is getting them. We also have children who depended on school feeding schemes for uh, food or from their friends. And so this lockdown will be a big issue for them. On the issue of child-headed homes, we have 
homes where the oldest child has to push trolleys or, or clean gardens in order to get money for food. And since the lockdown uh, has restricted that, how will the children get food? Here in KZN, we already have children suffering from uh, severe acute malnutrition. And those, most of those children are from childhood homes. And in every 10 of those cases, every one, um, one child dies in every 10 of those cases. We also have the issue of child abuse and neglect. Since the 27th of March, 449 cases uh, have been opened in relation to uh, domestic violence. And only three out of those are child abuse cases. I don't believe that three children have been abused, but it is because the lockdown limits movement. Uh, abused children don't have, most abused children don't have access to cell phones to call or report, and this lockdown does not allow them to run away from their abusers. Um, on the issue of neglect, uh, here in KZN, a parent has left an eight-year-old child to care for her younger siblings while she was gone for two weeks. And I'm sure this is not the only case. Uh, on to my concerns, I am worried about how included children are during this uh, COVID-19 situation because so far I have not seen stats on exactly how many children have coronavirus. I have not seen uh, stats on how well exactly this online education thing is, work is working for us. Um, I would also like to know what happens to the children whose parents are in hospital or have died because of COVID-19. Because here in KZN, shelters are full. Hello. And some are even reducing the number of residents to maintain social distancing. So what will happen to the children or even South Africans without a shelter? Um, um, a faculty here in Durban was going to house more than 800 people, but the landlord uh, feared quotes jeopardizing his reputation by housing street dwellers. And this is not the only case, I am sure. My third concern is the budget for children. Here in cases in we have five million children, mm -hmm. which almost makes up half of the population. And yet the apportionment does not back that statement. My fourth concern is the issue of going back to school. We some schools don't have water and yet they are expected to wash their hands. Some schools are, um, have small classrooms, overcrowded classrooms, and so if we, do, if we reach a specific number of children in classrooms, what happens to the rest of the children? My fifth and um, most important concern is that the Department of Social Development should not be coordinating child, children's matters. Um, the presidency should. Um, I say this because the Department of Social Development does not have full access to the Department of Health, the Department of Finance, or Education. So um, presidency is in charge of all of that. So I think that coordinating children's issues would be easier with that strategy. I thank you for listening to me. You have just been fired. Thank you, CV. Uh, <laughs> My job is done. I'm fired <laughs> just with fired. just what you said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you for your input. Can we now ask Bushe from Pumalanga, where the sun rises? Thank you, ma'am. Um, I'd like to greet you all once again. Um, I'd love to thank the MEC of Education, the MEC of Social Development in the province, and also the officials. And also, I'd, lo I'd love to thank the Office on the Rights of the Child. Um, we all know that child protection is the point whereby a child is being protected by the law from being bullied, raped, or even killed. Um, my first concern was about going to school. Um, I personally feel like it's really not a bad idea for schools to reopen, but the problem is the timing and the level that our country is in during this COVID-19 lockdown. I mean, we all want normality and schools to reopen, but we cannot go to school until it is safe to do so. We are worried about the spread of the virus if schools reopen and schools cannot close forever due to the virus. So we must find a way to live with the virus. Um, since schools are reopening next week, 
Some schools haven't received people who will be responsible for sanitizing, screening, and monitor the children to maintain social distancing. And also we have child survival, right? Um, during this lockdown, we have to look at the child survival, right? Firstly, we have to look at hunger and poverty. Some children depend on school feeding schemes for food, and then after school, they go to bed hungry. Um, their parents are not working, so they have no source of income. And then my other concern is home or online schooling. Under online schooling, not all of us have the money to buy data, and data nowadays is very expensive. Sometimes in our communities, we would go for about a week without network, so we cannot buy data, meanwhile, we have no network. And then under homeschooling, some of us cannot study without anyone explaining the notes to us. We cannot study without someone explaining. Our minds um, are not the same. Some can study alone, but some of us need people to explain the things to us because we have those learners who, who learn very slow and those who learn very fast. So we have to look at these things whenever we're making decisions. And also, um, there should be very safe measures that the government can put um, so that we can be safe to go to school and schools to open. Thank you. Thank you, Bushi. Now we're going to North Cup. Can I ask Cesar? Honorable members, honorable minister, and honorable de deputy ministers, to all our viewers and our children of South Africa, good day. I'm the child ambassador of I'm the provincial child ambassador for the Northern Cape. What I will be going on is the understanding of COVID-19. So far as the virus has continued, we've learned so far that we need to keep our hands washed and sanitized, masks on and to stay indoors. From what I've seen so far in the lockdown, I've seen masks, but I haven't seen the last one. People have been outside not caring about the, about the nationwide lockdown. And I'm worried because one, in, one person can infect the other and it will all lead to one of us being infected, even though it is us that are staying at home. Our future is reliant on all those that stay indoors. So to those outdoors, I suggest you stay inside because you guys could compromise our futures as uh -huh. we are already. The next is... How does it affect us as children? Children go to school not only for learning. It, school is also meant for memories and for fun and... Okay. <laughs> yeah. But basically, the schools are very important. I suggest that they stay closed. Yes, I will take from Mpumalanga that, yes, they deserve to be open because our matriculants need to write, especially our matriculants, because they need to go on. Grade 11s as well, because they are basically in pre-matric, and that's also a very important grade. <sighs> but my question is, once the schools open, how will unsanitized schools be prepared? Yes, we talked about getting all the equipment, all the PPEs, and maybe the virus will go down eventually and we will return to our normal lives. But what will happen if the virus doesn't go down? I heard of phasing in. I'm grade 11. I should be going to school in July. The schooling for matriculants start next week, Monday. If this virus continues, how will you phase us in? Like, um... Ah... <sighs> Relax. <laughs> Take a deep breath. Sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> it's okay to be nervous. Take a deep breath and continue. Okay. I've heard that some schools have been open before. I would like to know how did you get those children in the schools? Because the only way I know is that if the parents agree to this as well as the child and sign in DFT form to go to school, which I find kind of irresponsible because 
I mean, the government is sending our chil- our future in. So they should at least take responsibility for sending us in instead of our parents. Okay, I'd like to close it and go to the next one. Northern Cape is a very vast travel, more than 800 kilometers deep in rural areas. Those rural areas have no electricity. I doubt that they will be able to use cell phones, even if they have data, because there's no cell towers there to connect other phones. Online classes are not available, so the children cannot further themselves. And for those who have the resources and have the dot to do all these things, it is a struggle to get online classes going. Mm. But besides the fact of online classes, in rural areas, sanitation should be key because rural areas could be the most places where people can be infected. There's no sanitation. I doubt people or some people would even go to rural areas afraid of being infected or might even check for infected. So rural areas should be key because this is children we're talking about. Children are in rural areas as well as normal areas and high populated areas. So every child should be looked after, rural or not. Also, considering children, abusers do exist. And because school has been closed and all have been staying at home, lack of those people that can keep their anxiety down has been limited. So children are sitting like ticking time bombs at home. That I think is bad because if the child lashes out, the child is basically the bad guy because the abuser basically done nothing in the child in the in the child's eyes. Mm. And when it comes to blaming Adults are not blamed, but the children are, and they are sent for psychological treatment, even though the parents are the ones that should be sent there themselves. That is all that I will end with. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Caesar. I can see the other ambassadors are really nodding as you are talking, so you are talking to them also. Can we now go to Northwest? I've got two speakers. Yusuf and Onse Peng. Good afternoon, Minister Zulu, Deputy Minister Bukhopane, Program Director, Fellow Ambassadors, all and the media, all protocol observed. My name is Onse Peng Babele, and I am the current Northwest Children's Parliament Ambassador. And I'd like to thank the opportunity, the Department of Social Development, for this opportunity. And I would like also to wish all the children a happy International Children's Day. The COVID-19 pandemic case came as a surprise to all of us. Governments, schools, hospitals, parents and teachers, and us as students and children, no one was ready to face such chaos. This pandemic has taken a toll on us. Physically, be it physically, emotionally, mentally, and financially. Online schooling has its advantages and disadvantages. The positive side is that a learner is able to access more info on a particular topic and tend to have more time on their hands as they, as they make their own timetables and adhere to them because they are motivated enough to communicate because they can communicate with their teacher. On the other side, the downside is that not everyone is able or are forced to buy data on a regular basis. And not, not everyone has access to laptops or smartphones. Online teaching also promotes procrastination, hence they accumulate a lot of pressure in finishing their schoolwork as they think that they have time, but they don't. Learners who aren't self-motivated that need a face-to-face interaction with their teachers aren't able to do so at this stage, causing them to be demotivated and putting them at a huge disadvantage. I suggest that all districts in all provinces have a resource center where children who cannot afford, whose parents cannot afford to buy data can go and access and be um, positive to online, to online schooling. Our minds are already used to being wild and free. Roaming around and interacting with friends, be it at home or at schools, was part of our daily lives. The lockdown has restricted us and limited us to our yards. We can't visit our own friends, and it's like we we can't visit our own friends. And as we do this, this has had a 
bad impact on our mental development as human interaction is very vital for us at this age. Video calling and other forms of communication isn't available for every household, making contact almost impossible. Thank you, Yusuf. Are you there, Yusuf? Yes. Okay. Good day, Honourable Minister and fellow South Africans. Firstly, I think it's important to note that children often have the same fears that adults have. Fear of anxiety, fear of losing someone you love, feeling disheartened, loneliness. Personally, I'm of the privileged few in South Africa. I can afford to download my school's work over WhatsApp. I am able to access online resources and have access to my own study material. My main concern is, I, as a privileged person that has access to resources, has found it difficult to keep up with the schoolwork. So I can only begin to imagine the challenge that learners with far less resources are ex experiencing. And I think this is going to have a huge impact when we go back to, the, to school. And I personally feel that it's really going to reveal the stark inequality that exists in our society, particularly that will be prevalent in the former Model C schools. Let me explain. In the no-fee schools, most learners can af cannot afford to go online. In private schools, most learners have had uninterrupted schooling via Zoom classes. Now, the thing is with Model C schools, there's learners from different socioeconomic backgrounds. So you have a situation that's going to arise where a significant minority in these classrooms have not been able to keep up with lessons during the lockdown. And I feel that teachers need to be given the directive from government. We are as strong as our weakest link. Ladies and gentlemen, we find ourselves in a trying time and uncharted waters. And unfortunately, this has gravely impacted our education. I, as a matriculant, know that more than anyone. And I personally feel that in pursuit of saving this academic year, we should not rob students of a fair chance of furthering their education. NBTs have been scrapped in many universities. There has been unequal access to resources. We are competing for space in universities with learners from previous years that had undisrupted learning. We need to ensure that the class of 2020 are given a fair chance. Thank you. Thank you. I can see they even show the fist that they support what you say. Now I'm going to vest up Western Cape. I also have two speakers there. These are, this is our last province. Uh, I've got Alicia, Marcus, and also Ayak. We can hear you, Ayaka. Just unmute yourself. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Honorable Minister of Social Development and Deputy Minister of Social Development, um, the Nelson Mandela Children's Parliamentarian, um, as well as fellow children of South Africa. Um, my name is Ayaka Dono, and I am from the Western Cape Province. I am the ambassador at the Western Cape Province. Um, this lockdown has really been a roller coaster to many young South Africans out there. I mean, we've been exposed to many things, and it has also brought our lives to a major standstill. Many children's rights have been violated during this lockdown. A lot of children went to bed hungry due to financial issues. A lot of children were subject to physical, sexual, as well as emotional abuse. Many children live in unsafe environments that have an adverse impact on their lives as well as their intellectual well-being and social development of their lives. Many orphanages, especially here in the Western Cape, have not received any help from the government yet. This has put them in a difficult position because no they, they have no sponsorships and, and they also have no funds to go and buy food. The, reopenings, the reopening of schools has also sparked fear um, because our province has like the most highest, the highest cases. 
Um, the e-learning has only benefited those who are privileged, meaning that the right to education has been violated for most of learners around South Africa. Now, in township schools, they, there is overcrowding. So how do they expect us to, do, to practice social distancing when we do not have enough desks, when we do not have enough chairs, as well as textbooks? In conclusion, I would like to say that according to Act 108 of 1996, Chapter 2, the Bill of Rights, um, the Children's Subsection 2, children's interests are of, paramount in, are of paramount importance. So we ask our leaders to ensure that in every decision they make, children should be taken into consideration. You cannot make decisions about children without consulting children. I thank you. I will now hand over to my fellow um, parliamentarian, which is Alessio Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Marcus. Alessio. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Good afternoon, Ayaka. Thank you very, very much. Good afternoon, Madam Minister, Deputy Minister, and all other factions involved. I am Alessio Marcus. I attend Bleakneel High School in Mitchell's Plain, and I am the Deputy Speaker of the Nelson Mandela Children's Parliament. I would like to first of all thank the minister for this amazing opportunity to engage with you and i also want to thank you for being such an amazing political role model my experience under lockdown has been somewhat easy and difficult at times i as an individual am moderately comfortable in the sense that i have internet connection and i also have the opportunity can you hear me please continue okay thank you and, we, and I also had the opportunity to self-study. With that, I also have very supportive parents, which not many students can attest to. But the issue is that self-studying can indeed be very strenuous at times. Conversely, child abuse has also been on the rise, and every day the number rises. The lockdown resulted in children being locked up with their parents, which put many learners, or children, excuse me, in the vulnerable state of being abused. I know many learners who are waiting in anticipation for schools to fully reopen to escape their unhealthy environment. <laughs> Domestic violence has also seen a spike and children are exposed to the cynical behavior of their parent being abused in front of them. This affects the child's mental state and we need to come to the realization that children now have been exposed to this innumerable times, specifically at this point. I must commend the president, minister, deputy minister, and all other factions that put measures in place in order to help the vulnerable groups. If I may address the president, ministers, and the nation in the words of Tata Madiba, I quote, open quote, our children are the rock on which our future will be built. Our greatest asset as a nation. They will be the leaders of our country, the creators of our national wealth, those who care for and protect our people, close quote. I would like to once again thank the minister and all other factions involved, and I would like to end up with saying that I, Alessio Marcus, is here as a youth, for the youth, to make the youth. Thank you very much. Wow. We couldn't have ended in that high note. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, boys and girls. I think you can pat yourself on the shoulder. Your voices were heard. They were very loud. Thank you. Thank you. Now, before I hand over to the minister, I think it's important just to mention a few things or few initiatives that the department is busy with. For instance, I can talk to the issue of community-based early prevention and early intervention program, which we formally called ECBINDI. This program targets children that are orphaned and vulnerable, and it is run by the child and youth care workers that are trained at the community. And this program is implemented through safe parks and also drop-in centers and working with partner NGOs, more than 400 of them. So I will encourage the ambassadors as you interact with your, you know, your children, your fellow students, please make sure that you find resources around you where dropping centers are, where safe parks are, so that you can refer those children that don't have meals because in the dropping centers, that's where they can get meals. 
Now, the other initiative that we're busy with is the 365 days to prevent, you know, child abuse, neglect, and exploitation. We invite the children's ambassadors to be part of this program because this program targets dialogues with children and young people so that they can contribute meaningfully in their families and in society. Another program that I can share with you is the YOLO program, which is championed by the Deputy Minister. And the other one is CHOMI. YOLO basically means you only live once. Mm -hmm. So in that program, basically, you learn about sexual and reproductive health, mm -hmm. also your personal skills, hygienic skills, all other skills that you need as tools for you to carry you through as a young person and as a child. I can mention a lot of them, but this is not the time. I just want to encourage you to make sure that you communicate more with your social workers in your provinces so that you participate in more of these provinces. I know that in every child children's parliament, you always mention that you are not fully supported. I stand here and commit that we will continue to support you with resources, with information, to make sure that you spread uh, the voices of children. Over to you, Minister, to address uh, your children. Yo, hi guys, I can see you from here. How are you? Yeah, good to see you. Um, I'm happy to see you again. And uh, let me just thank you all for uh, coming up so quickly. I know we didn't give you enough time for you to prepare for this day, but it's just something that occurred to us as we were thinking about how can we deal with this um, uh, differently than we did because uh, of COVID. And we thought, why not connect to the ambassadors? Because we believe that you guys are, your amb are ambassadors for all the other children who have not had an opportunity to connect here today. I think I'd like to firstly thank in particular your closing remarks, by the way, you the next president, ne? let's agree. <laughs> um, I want to thank Tato um, sincerely and, and, and DM, thank you for taking Tato out and just having a, a, a conversation with her so that we can then be able to follow up uh, on the challenges um, that Tato is facing. You see, the face of poverty and the face of inequality and the face of struggle, when you look at Tato at a glance, you would not say anything you would think that Tato is fine. You see Tato in her uniform, nicely dressed, um, the way she speaks, the way she's in command of the language and all, you would think that everything is fine with Tato. It took Tato to stand here um, for her to be able to express herself and become emotional about it. And Tato, don't uh, feel very bad about it. Um, this is, you are expressing your journey you are expressing the challenges that are not only faced by you as Tato, but the challenges that are faced by millions of our other children uh, out there. And so you are strong, Tato. You be strong. And the fact that already you are in the structures uh, of parliament and you are a speaker, eh? yes, and the fact that you are a speaker, no one would understand what you have gone through in order for you to have been elected uh, to be a speaker and for you to have been given the opportunity to come here today and be part of this um, historic engagement. I call it a historic engagement because under normal circumstances we would have been meeting somewhere as I met with you guys uh, last year. I met for the first time with you because I came to your, your parliament. This is historical because we are faced uh, with COVID and in the middle of all that, we didn't say, oh, there's COVID, oh, there's nothing we can do about it. We thought, what can we do so that we can give the children their voice, which they would have had under normal circumstances in another parliament? And by the way, the children 
would have had the provincial parliaments. They would have started the provincial parliaments and meeting, culminating in the bigger meeting, which would have been uh, in parliament as it was uh, last year. So, guys, we thought let's give you the opportunity uh, so that we can hear your voices. Because, as you rightfully say, what has happened to you during this COVID is something that can be explained and be expressed by yourselves as children because who feels it knows it better. We thought your voices must be heard because the very theme uh, of this uh, 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 day of the children, International uh, uh, Children's Day, the very theme itself, it says, give children voices during COVID-19 and beyond. And let me tell you, I am here as a minister and a deputy minister. We are looking at the challenges that we are facing right now as children, as you yourselves indicated, from health uh, to education to transport to almost everything that makes it possible for you to grow into uh, 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 adults who can be able to take care of yourselves. We thought you should be part of the solutions. So the reason why we decided let's have you as ambassadors representing the rest of the children was for us to connect with you, having connected with you last year where I, I participated. We were part of your 2019 um, uh, uh, program and we received the children's manifesto from yourselves. And I had promised you that I will take this manifesto uh, to the president, the deputy president, and government in general. And I want to report back to you that I did do that. I did it the very week that you gave it to me. I gave it to the president. And I'm sure if you were to listen to the news again today, you will hear from that that the president is making reference to this very important day. But connected to this day, also remember, is the Child Protection Week. And that's where... We feel that your issues that you are raising here about the challenges that you are facing under COVID, um, the communication that we want to do with you is to say to you, it's Child Protection Week, but remember we said last year and the DM, we said the protection of children is not about a week. It is 365 days of the year. And our call to parents, and I like the fact I like that uh, one says uh, you were locked you were locked down, almost locked down with parents. It's like you can't wait to get out of there. <laughs> so the call uh, from the department, and not only just from the department, it's a call from government overall. Because I know that the Minister of Police, Minister Peggy Tele, and I hear one of you saying that you want to have the statistics, and I think we should. Uh, get those statistics and be able to say to you how much of the children have been affected. We can ask for that uh, statistics from the Minister of Health. We can give you those statistics. But of course, we are supposed to be celebrating, but I think for me is happy on one thing, that we are alive, happy that as South Africans we have managed to pull our resources together and work with each other. We are happy to have done that. But we are sad of the fact that many of you as children, you are fearful as to whether you should go to school or not. Your own parents are fearful of whether you have to go to school or not. I do want to say to you, you also need to take responsibility. Government must take responsibility of creating a conducive environment uh, for you to go back to school. And uh, we still have to have discussions about the ECDs and all that. We are on level three. And all of you must understand and appreciate what is the meaning of level three in as far as your life and in as far as your activities um, are concerned. And I want to say to you, your fears, the fears that you have, are our fears too. Because as parents, as grandparents, we do worry uh, about the fact that you have to go out there. We worry about you forgetting about your mask. We worry about you exchanging your mask. We worry about you just being children. Because when what, what would be happening is that you are just being children. But we also say to you, 
you need to take responsibility so that you can protect yourselves, so that you can also protect the people that you leave home. Because as you get out of home, your mother, your, your, your father, your grandfather, your whoever is there at home, your caregivers, they will be giving you the advice of what we are supposed to do. They will tell you that you must wash your hands as frequently as possible. They'll tell you that you must keep the distance. They'll tell you that you must keep your mask on as much as you... But once you are out of their space, they are expecting you to make sure that you follow that, so that you don't bring back um, uh, uh, the disease uh, back to them. I think I would like to say to you as ambassadors, I'm going to very much depend on you, and I think the DM would say exactly the same. We will depend on you because there was a reason why the people who are around you elected you. They elected you because they believe that you have a capacity to help them move from one point to the next. They elected you because they understood and believed that you have the courage and strength and will to represent them when it comes to being in parliament. They elected you because they understood that you know better the situation of your other peers around you, your schools, your province, and so. They elected you because they believed in you. So you are here today because I also believe in you. I believe in you because I listened to you last year when we were in Parliament. I believe in you, and I like the fact that you are saying we must consult with you so that you can help us find solutions to the problems. I do believe that where you are, you have solutions. You know we are talking about technology, using technology to try and, and, and find solutions to our problems. You are young, you go to laboratories, you go to studies. Those of you, by the way, who have uh, uh, places that enable you to do that. Because when, um, I don't know who was speaking from, from K, not KZN, who was speaking about the inequalities and talking about the fact that you are able to um, a study because you've got the laptop, you've got the data, you've got, and it's you who are raising the fact that not every child is in that space. And what uh, Connie was talking about in terms of what the department can do for you, I will depend on you, ambassadors, to carry that message to others to say it is possible. It's possible for yourselves to empower yourselves and also to help others. Look, it's very exciting to hear you talking about inclusion because this is what South Africa is suffering from, exclusion. There's still too many children who are in poor families, who are in situations where while we are busy talking about online learning, they don't even know what we are talking about. And therefore, I hear you talking about the budget for the children. I hear you talking about the presidency should be the coordinating children issues. Hey, I, was, I thought I was being fired here. Um, so you fired me now. Yeah, but you know what? I understand you. I get you because you are saying, if we are saying the highest office in the land is the office that has to, to, to respond to some of these issues, the president has got soldiers, and those soldiers are some of us. You see, he gives us the responsibility, and he is expecting us to respond to all the issues that we are, we are raising uh, 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 here today. I do want to also thank um, the provinces, the premiers, the MECs, and not only just the MECs of social development, but the MECs of everything else that is connected to children. I want to thank uh, the MECs of education, and I want to thank um, Minister NG Mutsekha, your, 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 your minister, uh, for, for your, your minister at the moment, as far as um, uh, education is concerned, basic education, we work hand in hand with each other to make sure that your life is made a bit easy. Uh, we work hand in hand, and so when there's struggles and arguments about whether schools should open or not, we are not excluded uh, from those discussions. We sit in the national, uh, in the NCCC and the net joints. We spend hours and hours looking for solutions of making sure that the, the, the nation as a whole works uh, with each other and make sure that your life and everything is improved. It's not easy 
uh, the conditions that we are facing today, by the way, I do want to say to you, it's not just about South Africa. The entire world is going through this difficulty. What I think is important is how have we handled it? How, what have we done to flatten the curve? What have we done to reduce the number of people that are exposed? Uh, what, what have we done to improve in our health system? What have we done to make sure that the messaging that we keep passing as government is a message that does not go over the heads of people? It is a message that is understood that you as an individual, you as a citizen, as you walk out of home, as you go doing what you have to do, are you really adhering to the protocols that have been explained uh, to you? As you come back home, are you conscious all the time that you might have gone to a place where you might have picked up the virus? Are you conscious that when you get home, you must make sure that you wash your hands, you must make sure that you are sanitized? And of course, again, the sanitization is something that we think that uh, all uh, government departments must help. And the issue is you, ambassadors, you must connect to your local government, connect to your provincial government. You are connected here to national government. And therefore, I'm leaving you with this message. And this is a message for me which I think we need to use all the time. We are, I'm saying, hashtag flat, flatten the curve of hunger because you are the ones who are talking about the challenges of inequality and hunger that's facing others. KwaZulu Natal spoke eloquently about the fact that some of the children, they go to school, they, they used to go to school, and at school they would have uh, the school feeding scheme. And I'm saying, let's also, I'm saying hashtag flatten the curve of inequalities, because that's what we need to do. And I think that if we can be able to use the lessons that we have learned now. It's amazing how much we have been able to stand up as South Africans and find a lot of food that is being distributed. I'm still asking the question and I'm calling on all South Africans, let the food still be there in December 2020, let the food still be there in December 2021, and let the food be there all the time. Because what the president has said to us, that nobody must go hungry, this short period of COVID has enabled us and has shown us that it is possible for us to mobilize with each other and collect and make sure that we support each other and distribute to the food to those that are, do not have the food. No one should be going hungry in South Africa, and COVID has taught us a lesson that actually it is possible for us to make sure that no one goes hungry uh, in South Africa, and no one goes hungry, in particular the children. I wish to thank you guys and say to you, let's connect, let's keep this going. We started it last year, we back at it this year, even if there's COVID, we said COVID or no COVID, we are connecting. Let's see each other again throughout the days. Remember, it's 365 days uh, protecting children from all forms of violence, from all forms of abuse. This is your time. When I say you the future, I really mean it. You need to then mobilize everyone else around you to really take charge of this future that we are trying to create for you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Minister. Um, you have spoken to your children, and I think the message is loud and clear. And also, I want to thank the Deputy Minister for also providing us with the opening remarks. And I think her message was clear because she was laying a foundation in terms of how we should make sure that children's rights are regarded as human rights. So we need to as South Africans to continue to ensure that we protect the rights of our children in the country. As we close, I want to remind you, boys and girls, if you don't have anything to say, because I think the message was clear, if there's any burning issue, I'll see a hand, but I don't see a hand as yet, is to remind you that this year you are going to interact with the national parliament. Uh, your children's parliament will be at that level of national parliament. So I can see you're excited. Uh, the national speaker
Africa will be awaiting to meet you with all other parliamentarians so that you can interact and raise your issues. That needs to be taken care of when they do oversight and also when they formulate laws that impact on children. So, or there's Gauteng who wants to say something. Tato, you can speak, oh, I think you can come. You can speak from your mind. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, I, when the minister was still speaking about the issue of food, part, food distribution, well, I acknowledge the fact that uh, social support grant has been uh, upped and also the fact that there's food parcels distributed across the country. But then I would encourage the department to strengthen its uh, di food distribution mechanism because some of us, where we come from, we have it, we had an issue of favoritism whereby the, the councillor is not providing food for people as she's supposed to. So I would like for the department to strengthen its mechanism in terms of distributing food parcels. I thank you. Thank you so much, Gauteng. Anyone online who want to say a final word before I close? Going. 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 Gone. Gone. I didn't see any hand. Thank you so much for connecting. Yeah. We will continue to interact, and the next session is coming with the national parliamentarians. Oh. Take care, guys. Be safe during COVID and beyond. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Tony. This was really good. Thank you. Done. That's it. You are okay. Thank you. You can see my human beings that are locked down with me. Yes. What's the reason why they feel like this in the Now we're in their space. Oh, but you know, I'm not you still want to finish. You want us to reconfigure.